I want you to think of this system as a guide. More specifically, it's a map. Is everyone comfortable using maps? Topographical maps, does everyone know what a topographical map is? It shows the elevations of, of land as an aerial view. That's essentially what this is. Starting at the nose, that would be the top of your mountain, and each concentric circle moving back goes further back into the face. Um, all systems start with ideal proportions, but very few faces actually fit the ideal proportions. There are certain commonalities involved so that you can look for relationships. Um, and, and that's a fascinating science on its own. I found that there is a relationship in many cases, and there's always exceptions, between the narrowness of the bridge of the nose here and the width of the philtrum here. So that when you're sketching out a face, you can run two vertical lines all the way down to where the upper lip is going to be and pretty much have those features lined up. And then you check it. You look at the face or, you, or the picture and you see if that's actually true or not. So we're going to go through this step by step. So if you have a blank piece of paper or if you want to flip this on the back or, or whatever, I would strongly urge you to follow along. <clears throat> Okay, so the first thing we're going to draw is a perfect circle. This is the easiest way to draw a perfect large circle. First, <laughs> it's five easy steps. You start with a dot in the middle. Right? Know where you want to place your circle. Find generally where the middle of the circle is going to be. Make a mark. In that mark, I want you to make a plus sign. right through that mark. Everyone can make a straight plus sign, vertical and a horizontal, right through that dot. Through that plus sign, I want you to make a large X. And the X has to be, think of a cutting a pie, right in between these, the, the legs of the plus sign. At the top of where you want the circle to be, draw a horizontal line through those X bars. At, at those overlapping corners where these lines intersect, drop two verticals. And where those lines intersect, draw your other horizontal line. That should be a square. Now's the easy part. You just draw the circle inside the square. But short of that, this is a good cheat to get your circle. All right. So you got your circle. Find the center of that circle. I want you to draw three circles between the center and the bottom of the circle. Make them all the same size. Like that. This bottom circle is the ball of the nose. The bottom of the large circle here will describe the part of the cheek, the border of the part of the cheek that hits the light. Draw three more circles the same size below that. Just like this. The bottom circle will be the point of the chin. 
So you've just, if this is the chin, this would be the hairline, not the top of the head, but the hairline. And this is the space that you divide into thirds, the space between the hairline and the chin, and we've done that. We've got three circles here, we've got three circles here, and although we haven't drawn them in, if this is the center, this should be three circles as well, so that's thirds, right? Eas easily done, we don't need that grid that we had last time. Using this system takes away that whole necessity to draw the grid. Makes it a lot less confusing, it's easier to do. And you can actually see this measurement on, on photographs. Okay, at the base of the nose here, draw a V. Think of it as if you had a tennis ball stuck in your rain gutter, and the V is your rain gutter. Now tennis ball is in there, right? From, from the outer wings of the V, it comes down. So essentially, you're drawing a shape that looks like this. I call it a hooked M because it's like an M. Now we're going to draw <clears throat> in the handout on the, on the graph there, I deliberately used circles when I can. I used a little compass or a circle template. But when you're drawing from a photo or real life, these circles are not going to be perfectly round anymore. They're gonna be more pear-shaped. Things are going to be narrower towards, oh, they almost all start at the bridge of the nose or this part of the nose. So they're going to all be narrower here and kind of flare out. It depends on the face. Some faces are narrow, some faces are wide. You'll have to observe and do the best you can trying to follow that line. So the first one we're going to do is the nose saddle. The nose saddle starts at the bottom of the first little circle and goes to the bottom of that M that you just drew. Now starting from the top of the ball of the nose, you're going to draw another circle down to the bottom of the next to last circle. And you're going to make that wide. If you can imagine where the eyes will be, you want to at least have that width. Are the sides the middle of the eyes or the inner part of the eye? Um, the middle of the eye. And then we're going to draw the chin circle. The chin circle starts at the bottom and is as high as one half of the circle above it. You'll notice that when you drew that muzzle circle here, the space between that M and that muzzle circle is basically where your nostril wings will be. You've already indicated that part of the face by the ball of the nose. So one more circle starting from the bottom of the first little circle. It's what they call the laugh lines. A lot of circles. Goes to the bottom of the chin from top of the second circle. One more bizarre circle. Starts from the same point where these others are starting from, the bottom of the first circle. But this one goes up 
to the hairline. And it's not really a circle. It's more like an egg shape. A little wider at the top. This is the forehead, the shape of the forehead. And while it's not an essential aspect, you may notice, as I have, that you have a very strong figure eight. From the top of the forehead to the chin. This pointy part of that last shape you drew is very important because it indicates the space between the side of the nose and the eye, a space that is often either neglected or inaccurately placed when doing faces in detail. You won't, probably won't need this if you're doing faces that are far away, but the closer you get and you're starting to see features of the eye, that's going to be important. Put in two circles for the eyes. It should be snug up against that top, the bottom of the top circle you drew. but a little bit lower than that brow line. It can't touch the brow line. It depends on, on who you're looking at, but generally there's a little bit of space. So does everyone see these two lightly drawn circles here, mm -hmm. just below the nose? Mm -hmm. Where those two circles touch, make a little horizontal line. That's about where the two lips meet. And because the mouth has a sharper curve than the rest of the face, right, your bite, angle the sides of the mouth generally downward, sometimes upward. It depends on <clears throat> your model. It also depends on the angle of their face. It's subtle. You don't have to make it a frown. And at the end of those, kind of like in line with the eyeballs, center of the eyeballs, just make that two little dots, the terminal parts of the corners of the mouth. Below that mouth line and behind the tissue there are the lower teeth, which are part of the lower jaw. So I'm saying that obvious point because there's, there's a, a unit that I want you to be aware of. This part here on Mr. Osman. <clears throat> Using a gentle sweeping curve from that mouth line because the face is now curving around, so you can't really do it straight, so you want to indicate some of that. Okay, now we're going to draw those two parallel vertical lines that I was talking about earlier. Depending on your model, they will run from the second small circle that you drew down to the lips. That will indicate this plane of the nose. <clears throat> Your model may have a crooked nose, a thin nose. Um, if, you're, if you're drawing models of different ethnicities, you will see great variation of how this structure is formed, and you'll have to make changes accordingly. On that first circle there, when those parallel lines reach there, just flare them outward.
and that creates that little keystone shape in between your eyebrows. Follow the vertical line up and when it reaches that first top circle, flare it outward. And as the line flares outward, continue it a, a little bit horizontally over the eyes. That'll give you the bottom of that brow bone. What are we doing now? Flare, Flare out and then straight across. Not all the way across, just over the eye. You can see some of the subtleties of how the form of the lower lip can be. And it's, it's different on different people. Some people, it doesn't look like it dips up this way, it goes the other way. So it, it's, it changes per person. But as a general blueprint, doing it this way shows that the lower lip is basically two large lobes that meet at the center, and that's what often causes that little dip. The upper lip has three lobes, one on each side, but one in the middle that comes down to a little point right here, right? We're going to move up to the eyes now. So right about here where, where all this action is happening, this big junction here, if you draw a very shallow curve from one eyeball going through that line to the other eyeball like that, as if they were spectacles, but make that bridge lower, right? From here to here. Where that arc touches the ball that you drew for the eyeball, make a dot and let that mark the general placement for your inner corner of the eye, the tear duct. Now the outer corners of the eye in relation to the inner corners of the eye varies greatly. In younger people, in models and in, in famous actors, they generally tend to be a little above the corner of the eye, but not always. If you look at pictures of Clint Eastwood, I think the corners, outer corners of his eyes are actually lower. So you'll have to look at your model. But generally, they're either at equal level or a little higher for the, the glamorous actresses of the 40s and 50s, they were accentuated to be much higher. Gave them that cat eye look, right? So place a dot at or above the same level of the inner dot. And connect that with a, an arc that goes through the keystone. So you have an arc for the inner and an arc for the outer. What I like to do when I get to the outer corner of the eye is I like to hook back in. I'll show you. At, at the end of the arc, I just hook in again, kind of like we did with the nostrils. So I know that that's where the outer corners of the eyes are and the lower lids start. The lower lids has less of a curve generally across from one eye to the other.
at the outer corner, outer sides of the eyeball, here and here. I want you to draw a curving arc sweeping in and then outward and upward, touching or coming close to the side of that forehead circle that you drew. Doesn't matter how long you make them, definitely make it go evenly, gracefully upward. This marks in the front of the face the lines of the temple. That it's actually the turning point, the corner of your face where the front plane turns towards the side planes. It's very distinctive, especially with dramatic lighting. You'll see often a core shadow running across that. It's a wonderful characteristic of the human skull. You draw a gently curved line upwards from the inner corner of the eye to the junction of the brow line and temple line. This will be the inner part of the upper eyelids. So this is that junction of the brow line and the temple line, right there. So from that dot that you made of, for the inner corner of the eye, you're going to make a sweeping curve that connects that corner to the dot. Curve that you did of the eyes, what you have now in rough form is the shape of your eyes. Everybody has a round eyeball, just a bit, little bit bigger than a ping pong ball. How the lids go around that ball is what you want to capture. So sometimes you have where the outer corner of the eye is higher than the tear duct, right? And sometimes you just have a part of, of the upper eyelid that just drops down. And as we get older, this tends to drop down in a more pronounced fashion. So you're not going to see so much where the origin of the eyelashes are coming out. It's going to be hidden by this flap of tissue. And that's what gives Clint Eastwood that really squinty look, is because now this has come down and it makes the corner of the eye at least level with the inner corner of the eye. We're going back down to the jaw again. 19, find that shape of the face, find the jawline. Some will be square, some will be pointy. It really depends. Some people have a large chin mass here. Some have a very shallow chin mass and not a lot of muscle down here. But find what this angle is and extend it beyond that other arc that you drew earlier. So now you have like an X point right here, right? Where the two lines meet. and draw a line that connects the side of that ball that you drew, the first big ball that you had. Okay, now we're going to work from front to back. We're gonna use a couple of lines to indicate the cheeks 
the cheekbones, but the cheekbone no longer just addresses the front of the face because it wraps around and goes back to the ear. Using a topographical flat map, it looks odd, but as the head turns, and as you'll see in the photographs, you can see those lines in any angle. And this is what I'm talking about. I want you to draw a pair of lines that look like that. They start at the corner of the mouth. They go to the nostril. And then they sweep up to the bottom of the ball of the eye and continue to the brow line and beyond. See that? Corner of the mouth, sweep in to the nostril reach the ball of the eye, whoop, and out. This now gives you the plane of the upper lip, and it gives you the upper part of the cheek, and it gives you the top of the ear. So at that, where it touches the brow line, make an angled line downward. And from there, draw another line. That looks like that. Okay, so starting from here, it goes down to like where the circle is or near that bottom of the big circle. And then it meets up with the laugh line about the level of the mouth and then just kind of melds into that laugh line. Find that cheekbone, meld in with the laugh line. I'm gonna try to show you where those sweeping lines go one more time. I'm gonna start with that figure eight I was talking about. All right, so by eliminating a lot of the other distracting lines, that's the chin. Starting from here, from the corners of the mouth to the nostril, to the bottom of the eyeball, sweeping outward past the height of the brow line. Corner of the mouth to the nostril, out like that. Near that, Another line that connects to the lower portion of the laugh line. From here, like that. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm just doing it again <clears throat> to, make, to clarify it. it 
Yes, thank you. So the really fun thing about this is if you connect these two lines here and drop down to the level of the nose, you have a placement for the ears. These sweeping lines that came out of the head like horns? All right. So at the level of the hairline, you see that there? Mm -hmm. Change the direction of that curve and bring it back down to the head behind the ear. So the tops of these three curves is the upper portion of the frontal plane and the upper portion of the side planes. And f as with an 80 cube box or anything that's got six sides to it, you need a top plane. So the top plane starts from where these end up here. So just connect it like that. If you have lighting from above, this plane is going to catch a lot of light. And now we're going to create the brow bone. It's here, right there. But since this is a round form, it often looks like that. And then it comes down. to the cheek line. So this will be the top of the brow bone. This is the sides. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. I hope you all took away something that you can use, either immediately or later on. This was great. Thank you for the Thank you, David.